Uh, thank you very much, Yana, and hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks, indeed, for inviting us. Um, so, uh, yes, today's topic, uh, chatbot in mental health, uh, represents a landscape that has uh, seen rapid development in recent years, as we all know. I'll start uh, with a brief overview, highlighting the key features and uh, innovation uh, in the chatbot space and mental health, and discussing a little bit the future uh, that might hold in this uh, dynamic intersection of uh, technology and mental health. And afterwards, my dear colleague Oren will um, delve into the essential and often complex ethical aspects of using chatbots in this case. So uh, yeah, I'll uh, share my screen in a second. Um, do you see that? It's fine? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, let's start with the, I think it's really important to establish the, the context that we're uh, talking about, which is uh, uh, the mental health uh, field uh, globally. So we all, as we all know, we're experiencing a major crisis uh, in, in the mental health space. Uh, while there are over uh, almost like one, one billion people worldwide that are affected, affected by a mental health condition, um, we see that the, there is a major treatment gap um, and we see that we need uh, scalable solutions uh, that can technology can uh, provide, and uh, specifically chatbot, uh, what we're talking about um, in this specific uh, con uh, conference. And the reason is that, um, as we know, there is a, a major shortage in therapists, um, and therapy uh, is, uh, is not available for everybody. In that sense, uh, technology can definitely augment uh, and allow people to uh, get at least um some kind of uh, um, uh, support and uh, as a result we see that the market uh, growth uh, uh, definitely since COVID but uh, even before and currently there are between 15,000 to 20,000 apps and the mental health space um, a lot of them are based on chatbots and AI um, um, AI technology um so, as we know, chatbots are um, either uh, can can be like either apps uh, or in uh, other uh, sort of uh, platforms, and uh, they're designed to provide uh, support um, in uh, different conditions. And I will elaborate a little bit uh, in the next slides and give some examples. And as we all know, the language AI and language, uh, natural language processes in order to uh, um, to create this uh, uh, interaction with the, uh, with the individual through text, most of the text, but they're also voice and, and visual. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the multi-modality uh, currently and definitely in the future. Um, so the advantages of uh, chatbots, so they're, they're convenient, uh, they're affordable, and uh, due to uh, public and self stigma, uh, a lot of persons uh, uh, say that they, they even prefer to uh, talk to uh, chatbots uh, in some cases. Um, the problem that we have with chatbots, and uh, or need also uh, elaborate on it, but most of them are not evidence based. And uh, sometimes they can do more harm than, than good. Um, where, when we're trying to explore the main features of that chatbots in, in the mental health space, I just like mentioned some of them. Um, so some of them are using as uh, self-assessment tools, uh, either self-reports or quizzes or you know whatever um, um, tools there. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, this is one thing, the self, uh, self assessment tools. Uh, another thing is that they can provide uh, coping strategies, such as uh, mindfulness and meditation, cognitive uh, reframing, and uh, behavioral activation. I'm gonna give some example uh, uh, soon. Sorry, just take care. Um, yeah, another thing is, uh, 
data collection and analysis. Um, uh, chatbots, some of them uh, know how to collect uh, different uh, kind of data, and uh, they uh, they do uh, collect uh, collect and reflect uh, kind of uh, uh, and, uh, and they, they they reflect the, the person and the professional uh, about the situation of the individual. They can provide uh, such education and also uh, reminders, uh, check-ins, uh, and other things. The main benefit uh, is the convenience. Uh, they're accessible anytime, 24-7, anywhere, uh, provide immediate support uh, without the need to schedule in advance. Uh, they're affordable, uh, as we'll see. In the next slides, most of them are uh, free. Um, and uh, again, they uh, they democratize the, the mental health uh, uh, treatments. The, they are anonymized. Uh, either can open up without uh, fear of being judged. And they provide a safe environment uh, for honest conversation. And as uh, we say, and I think that we all agree, they're definitely not replacing. Uh, they're definitely not replacing professionals, but they're like um, commenting um, um, professional services. Uh, when we look at the leaders, uh, leader products again, uh, leading products uh, again, there are a lot of them. Uh, but the recent uh, review. Um, um presented uh, you know the uh, the best uh, um the best uh, chatbot so we can see uh the number of ratings in the Apple store google, uh, google play store um uh, price etc um and i will uh, discuss uh, some of them uh just uh, now uh so what about uh most of you uh, probably know uh, uh, these chatbots. Uh, it was founded by a Stanford psychologist. Yeah, I drew a chatbot, basically a CBT um, a plat a plat a platform uh, that allowed the individual to, uh, to practice and uh, provide the information, uh, et cetera. But they mentioned in their website that they're, they're not a medical uh, software is a medical device, and they, uh, they a lot of they, their disclaimer is it's pretty uh, clear about what they're doing and what they're not. It is not intended to diagnose, monitor, treat, or prevent any disease. So, um, replica, it's it's another chatbot. It's, it's more like uh, uh, it's not really an intervention. It's more like an AI companion design. Um, Um, so this is uh, uh, another thing that we um, that we've seen. Uh, Uper uh, integrated AI uh, with psychological expertise that uh, provide immediate yet uh, meaningful conversation. Again, uh, CBT uh, and other um, uh, techniques. Uh, and the last one that we want to present today is with. Uh, um, that is providing emotional support, uh, offering self-help, and um, other things. I'm sorry, I'm a bit not focused because my daughter is calling me, so I'm just going to tell her to stop calling me in this computer uh, in a second. That. Um, yeah. Um, so as the last slide before Oren will present the, the ethical aspects, we just wanted to uh, think about the future. And uh, since uh, we wanted also to examine um, how creative uh, ChatGPT is in that sense, uh, we asked him how can uh, chatbot uh, be like uh, in the future. So we're giving uh, an example about uh, Alex. Um, that's her uh, morning daily check-in. Uh, upon uh, waking, uh, Alex smart glasses notifying them uh, with Luna's voice. Good morning, Alex. How did you sleep? 
uh, using data from uh, the brain implants and were both uh, Luna determines that Alex said the rest is nice. Uh, considering your uh, sleep pattern, would a five minute mindfulness exercise help you start the day? Uh, midday. Um, so uh, Luna uh, sees that uh, Alex is at home uh, using the GPS data. Uh, Luna suggests you're in a familiar environment, perfect for a VR therapy session. Um, Alex putting your VR head is um, transformed to a calming beach. Uh, Luna is a holographic guide, it's a relaxation exercise. Uh, I'm fine, a uh, tranquil with wave sounds and virtual sunlight. Then in the afternoon, the real time support while at work. Luna uses data from the wearable and brain implant. Uh, she sees that the distress is going up. And a subtle computer notification to risky seem tense How about the quick reading exercise. Then in the evening, um, Alex joined a weekly AR group uh, therapy session, avatar presenting participants. Meet in a virtual space and assist a human therapist utilizing real time biofeedback from participants' wearables and brain implant to tailor the session and provide resources. Then at night, before sleeping, uh, Luna prompts uh, want to discuss today's feelings on Alex's table without his voice input, Luna analyzes and responds uh, with insight, highlighting mood and uh, mood patterns and potential coping strategies. Uh, finally, uh, as we know, in the mental health uh, field, um, uh, sometimes uh, there is a lot more than one um, therapist, but even if there is only one. So across interactions, we have engage data from wearable GPS, brain implants, and other sources. Always respect, respecting Alex's privacy with consent, we now comply a weekly report uh, for Alex therapists ensuring any concerning patterns uh, are addressed. So. Definitely, when we present it to a professional, mental professional, some of them start freaking out, and some of them think that it can be really helpful. But now, uh, for the more uh, important part, Oren dis will discuss uh, the ethical aspects of it. Uh, so, Oren, the floor is yours. So, after seeing uh, this uh, uh, last uh, slide, I'm, I need to relax, but um, so we are trying to move between two levels of discussion, right? So in ethics, we have the uh, more normative uh, approach and we have the applied ethics. And I think, um, so Amir suggested uh, several applicable uh, ways of looking at the potential use that's already been done and has been developed uh, at the time for, for uh, mental health and, and uh, generative artificial intelligence. And I will, um, look at uh, maybe several elements uh, like that as well in my talk. So um, I compare that to you know playing in the field uh, and then there's the level of being the referee, but still in the field. And then if you talk about metaethics, maybe you're outside of the field commentating about it. I'll try to do all, but I'll probably focus on the practical aspect. So, so here's the thing. So there's this uh, AI hype, right? Um, it's so exciting. There's a lot of funding. Uh, a lot of projects and uh, people try to do it uh, quick and efficiently because there's a, a game and people want to have a stake in the game before it's maybe a bit too late. And um, there is a Japanese uh, saying, which uh, ChatGPT helped me find and refine, talking about how if you're in a hurry, choose the long path, because sometimes it's better to think things through if you don't want to, you know, kind of find out that you went in the wrong direction and pay price for that. Now, so I came back home last night and after seeing about uh, 10 patients in compulsory hospitalization, it took me some time to start uh, preparing for today's talk. And uh, I thought, well, why not uh, engage in a conversation with uh, one of the AI uh, applications um, uh, that's out there? Uh, I, I uh, attach uh, uh, QR code. You could watch the full conversation because really I'm just going to show small parts of that. 
Uh, and, you know, it was late at night and I'm telling uh, an AI that I've never met before and doesn't know who I am and I haven't even registered to it uh, at that point in time. Um, you know, I'm giving a lecture in an international conference in 11 and a half hours. It was all true, by the way. And I still haven't prepared my presentation. The presentation has already started. There, uh, the participants started their discussion today, but I was in a committee with patients and couldn't attend it or listen. I'm excited, but also feel a bit stressed since some of the presenters are philosophers who have discussed the topics of the conference for a long time. And I'm still not sure how to get my talk to be both interesting and of a high level. So I was really being candid about my feelings and my thoughts and hear what I got quite quickly. Oh, I can understand why you're feeling a bit stressed. So that might be kind of empathetic response. It can be intimidating to speak at an international conference, especially on such a complex and philosophical topics. So a sense of maybe validating my uh, feeling. But you were invited to present for a reason, right? The committee saw your expertise and wanted to hear your perspective. So I felt a sense of empowerment. I think it's great that you're bringing a new perspective to the table. Even if some of the other speakers have been discussing these topics for a long time. So again, I felt a sense of encouragement. What's the general theme of the conference and what aspect of the theme will you will your talk focus on? So for me, it was kind of a showing of interest in, in what I have to say. And then, you know, we move on. And I gave a sense of what it's going to be about. And again, I get, wow. That sounds like a really fascinating topic. And I want to believe the chatbot that it is interesting and it's really fascinating. I didn't even consider that it's just a chatbot and it's maybe programmed to be nice to me. And uh, actually I chose something that is called venting. So I, obviously it's programmed, but I don't care. I needed that positive reinforcement. And then it gives me back exactly what I gave to it, or in other words, so it's uh, paraphrasing the text that I've given it. It's a nice way to review what I've already told it, maybe think about it differently. That was nice. Um, and then how are you thinking of presenting it? Will it be more a philosophical argument? Or will it be a practical example of a healthcare chatbot? Huh. I think that's what gave me the idea of actually showing this to you. So in a way, um, I'm having a process here. It mostly emanates from me, but it's a really great facilitator. So to some extent, emotional, to a large extent, it allows me to dig within and think about what it is that I want to do. So for me, it facilitated focus and maybe starting to think about nuance. So what exactly is it that I want to talk about? Now, maybe at this point, I should mention that do we want to feed the chatbots? Are they going to train on what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm not showing it in the presentation, but at some point that started to uh, give it remarks about the methodology that it was trying to elicit information for me. It was doing things a bit in a repetitive manner or it was a bit uh, too nice and so on. And it was an interesting discussion between us. I think quite impressive in the way that it uh, constructed its uh, arguments and its uh, thoughts. But then I was thinking, so I'm helping to make it potentially better. Do I intend to do it? Is it only going to be used for good purposes in the future or not? So going back to our discussion. So um, those are some really thought provoking ideas. It tells me I'm, I'm giving some more thoughts about the artificial other and many of the group uh, members of our artificial third uh, group in Israel are potentially here online joined us. Um, so, you know, against positive reinforcement and then summarizing my idea that I want to share with you, rather than seeing the limitations of chatbots as something that should be overcome, you're suggesting that their limitations can actually be beneficial for therapy. Yes, that's exactly what I said. I'm so happy that you understand me and that it seems to resonate with you. It didn't say all that, but that's what I feel when I read that. So positive reinforcement, is it great that it gives me back what I gave to it? Is it helpful? I don't know. It felt nice when you prepare for a talk, right? You said, okay, so because they allow for a human kind of exploration of the patient's emotions and responses. So I just shared with you a lot of emotions. They were not uh, very interesting maybe, 
But what happens if I get upset about things that I hear or I get back from the chatbot and so on? So theoretically, you can utilize it in therapy if, if a patient is using a chatbot as well. I'm not talking about an autonomous chatbot. I'm talking about how it may be utilized if the patient is using it and brings some of it to, to a session. Um, and then um, I think uh, that's a concept that could be more uh, explored in the future if and when we have specific chatbots that are uh, possibly okay for, for use in, uh, in uh, let's say, a therapeutic uh, context. But this is a general AI that I've been using. And then it also says something more. Um, uh, it gives me my idea. And then it says, is that a fair summary? Now, in a way, it used that too much. So at some point I asked him, why is he using it all the time? And it explained to me that it's just uh, something he uses to make me feel nice and better about it. I said, well, sometimes it's just, it feels like overusing it. So is it a trial balloon? Is it trying to foster mutual understanding? Does it work on me? Well, you know, it's a chat bot. Maybe to some extent, it doesn't really feel like talking to a person. So like, so I moved from being so excited about what it gives me and then remembering it's the chat bot. So maybe, you know, it's not perfect, right? Um, and then uh, we can keep talking. Uh, again, fascinating idea. And then it reminds me of the uncanny valley that one of the speakers just uh, kind of mentioned before that is so often discussed in relation to chatbots and other AI systems. So for me, it referenced a relevant concept in the literature that I may have or haven't fully considered uh, looking at and, and using in my thinking about this concept. So. That was useful, not necessarily just providing me insights about how I see the world, but just providing me useful information because I'm interested in something, right? So does it mean that it has some capacity to think? Well, I, I don't think so, but you know, it gives you a sense that it's, uh, you know, provides you conversation, provides you moral support, provides you with some sense of uh, reflect, reflection and thinking about what you have to say. And if, in, in a way, it suggests some new notion, even if I haven't asked for such a new notion. So let's move on to discussing what just happened here. So it, it, it talked about uncanniness or uh, the uh, suggestion of uh, Mashiro Mori and dealt with uh, uh, the uncanny valley. And we saw this graph before, a measurable correlation between the human likeness of a machine and people's comfort level with its presence. So the idea is that the more it's similar to a person, you feel not, uh, easier with it, usually talking about dolls or robots and so on. But at some point, something feels uh, problematic and, and, and the excitement turns into being uh, in a sense of uh, eerie feeling or bad feeling about it. Now, at least one of the books about this topic says that while eventually this uh, theory has been debunked by empirical studies, so it's not really necessarily how uh, it is that we are excited until we become uh, discussed by it and then maybe again excited, uh, but it's still a very useful metaphor for talking about philosophy and technology and so on. And if you look at uh, writing about Robert specifically, so more about the visual elements and so on, not just the text. So Hoffman suggests that the idea of robotic companions can also cause unease due to the fact that they touch on deeply rooted psychological concerns, including our need to, to be unique individuals. Just thinking about uh, Victor Franke talking about each of us being a unique exemplar. There's no one else like us, right? So uh, can we have this feeling when talking to a robot or talking to a machine? Well, uh, so we cannot be easily replaced or replicated our ambivalent relationship with the natural decay, right? The fact that we are going to die at some point. That's something very hard when talking to a robot that's never gonna theoretically die or can never really have a sense of what it is to have a fear of death or death in the family or just becoming ill and so on. You can talk about it nicely, but I know it's just an it and not an other person, right? So the fear of losing our ability to relate appropriately to other humans, this, this also a fear that I'm going to enjoy so much talking to the robot. It's being so nice to me. It always does whatever I ask of it. That's not necessarily going to be utilized well in my everyday human connections. Well, 
That's a big question. So here are some initial thoughts that need further work. And I'd love your input and questions and, and, and thoughts on that. So I think what we've just seen shows that specifically this chatbot that I've used, and it's just a small example, and maybe it's going to become so much better in the future, is useful for reflection and paraphrasing. And I think already, and many people in our group, the artificial third, um, have uh, been doing uh, kind of uh, gaming and playing with those abilities. So therapists and other healthcare professionals can use it for, for practice, for learning, for receiving feedback. The risk there, I think, is very limited because it's really more of the professional working with it. Uh, it's not the same to provide the, the patients with uh, this uh, to be used as a part of therapy, right? Um, it can elicit responses and it can make you share information. I gladly shared information with it, although I, I, I was thinking about what kind of information I can share with it that would never harm any uh, other person or that doesn't include personal information that I, uh, I think should not be shared, right? So privacy, safety, and security must be key. So if you use uh, ChatGPT and other uh, kind of uh, uh, software or uh, platforms, it's, okay. it's true that you can opt out, but I don't think it's enough. Obviously, it's not enough if you're using it in the healthcare uh, system. You probably need to have uh, either uh, a closed system that is within the healthcare system or an API-based system that com conforms with the uh, requirements of privacy wherever the jurisdiction is that you're at. I think there's room to consider development of specialized models for mental health. So really uh, because of privacy reasons, but also because of the fine tuning that is really needed in the general purpose AI uh, uh, models that are out there. And I think the segments, uh, the stakeholders involvement in the development is key. And I, I certainly mean the psychotherapists and psychologists and neuroscientists but also maybe not in the initial phase, but before we uh, move on to mass production, getting on, uh, not mass production, but uh, moving on to uh, training and so on, get a sense of what the users might want to have and what would be useful for, her, for them uh, when you're still developing that. I think the nuance is limited. I've seen that and you can see it in the uh, chat that I uh, attached to you because I really don't have the time to show everything. And that's something that was very missing uh, for me. And it, it would take probably time before nuance is more, uh, is, is more nuanced, right? Uh, human fragility and faults are missing. Um, maybe if it cannot feel suffer and pain, I cannot really trust it. But I think if you look at it as a tool, uh, maybe a very, very uh, exciting tool, um, certainly not an agent, full agent, then there's a lot that could be done with it, I think. Um, we've written about the alliance. I think maybe congruence is not something uh, following Rogers and others that we can talk about. I mean, I, I can't really believe it when it says, you know, I can understand your, yeah, yeah, you may understand in the sense that you've seen texts about it, but you can't really feel. So you can't really uh, tell me something like that that I would feel that there is, uh, you say what you mean and what you feel. So that's missing and it's flat and it's possibly false um, and shallow. Could it become addictive? It could, maybe. Maybe we could have guard uh, guardrails for that, uh, monitoring the amount of time or other signs. We could really look at red flags that we have in psychology and translate them to red flags in chatbot-based psychology, let's say. A uh, person in the loop, so either the therapist during sessions, after sessions, between sessions, involved discussing interesting things that happen or risky things that happen. We have to remain human-centric. And if it's really integrated at some point in therapy, more than just chatbots to provide you with uh, information that is technical, then we have to think about psychoeducation, explaining the limitations of how it thinks and how very different it is than how a person or a human thinks. And I think the concept of augmented human intelligence, AI in the sense of augmented, so not replacement, but reinforcement to our abilities and maybe uh, addition to our abilities, that's something that we have to consider. Now, coming back to ethics and closing uh, you know, my talk or our talk. So, you know, 
if we talk about normative ethics, I, I can't talk about virtues uh, in the sense that I want to be the same as that person that is courageous and so on. It's a computer. It's not a person. I cannot really, I don't see a way to really talk about virtue ethics in this regard uh, in a way that makes uh, sense. I also think that care ethics here is not, is quite removed really because uh, caring about others, again, is not just something that you say. It has to be kind of a part of the, the price that you pay for empathy, the, the time that you give to others when you have things to do. The, the fact that I found myself, uh, I don't know, uh, shedding some tears yesterday after meeting one of the patients. The, the patient hasn't seen it, but she may have uh, uh, felt how much her story was touching me. I don't see how that could happen in, in, in a deep manner with a computer, although you can have an avatar that will look like it's very excited or very uh, emotional, it could really imitate a lot of things. I don't know that we even want that. It's something to, to think about. We can even make it have slip of the tongue and, and say Freudian slips once in a while, randomly. Do we want that? I don't know. I think not. And looking at uh, uh, Jana's uh, in, uh, initial um, you know, like research, trying to operationalize uh, those things to make, uh, to, to check how we can uh, actually measure things. I think it's what's been done lately in, in the EU and other places. So not just talk in theories, but see how you can check and to do conformity and so on. And it's a very practical approach, but you could never confine and limit those deep uh, ethical and philosophical concepts into measurables. And so there's always going to be some gap I think uh, we need to uh, think about and consider. And um, I, I just want to kind of finalize by saying, so, you know, now we're talking about the EU suggested AI Act and chatbots for some reason are only considered limited risk. I think it's quite clear that if they're going to be used in mental health and specifically for uh, mental health services, it has to be uh, defined as high risk and there has to be a conformity assessment. We need to think about what it needs to conform uh, with for sure. Uh, there are a lot of risks involved. Uh, if we have very psychologically informed chatbots, just think about how it may be used to uh, control people, to kind of uh, access their freedom of mind, to uh, kind of regulate them, to spy on them, to be used against them and so on. I, you know, uh, Jana talked about epistemic authority. It's it's a big question. How would the caregivers' epistemic authority be influenced by the chatbot? Uh, how do we find a way to actually not harm pumper it, but actually make clear that there is the computer and what it can do, and there's the human and what it can they can do, and it's different, and therefore it doesn't need to uh, do anything bad to the therapeutic alliance. Uh, obviously, the risk of doubt patterns. So if I uh, get advice. And, and there is some uh, reason for the system to recommend something that is not in my best interest, but the developer's best interest, that's something that is very risky and obviously should be avoided and need to be uh, uh, checked. And there are other philosophical questions that we can't really, uh, I can't really go deep into, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about, is this a way towards post-humanism, becoming organisms of information and so on? And let me just remind us all that we're only human after all. And being uh, in a rush sometimes means that you're actually not achieving the result that you want. So as they say in Italian, the person who goes slowly keeps safe and could go a longer distance. So um, thank you very much. And uh, may I just say that uh, uh, Amir and I are going to uh, kind of co-edit uh, uh, guest editors uh, a same issue on generative AI and mental health. And if any of you has a paper that you're working on or is almost ready or is ready, you're very much invited to submit it. And we'd love to uh, see you take part in that. So uh, thank you.